Hello friends and welcome to day 23 of our Chronological Bible Reading Commentary. Uh, my name is Kenny, I'm a pastor in East Texas, and I do these videos in the hopes that it will help all of us, myself included, better understand the scripture as we read through it in the course of a year. Today we're in Genesis chapters 32 through 34, and we've got a couple of really interesting observations. So if you haven't read that yet, go ahead and stop the video, read it, and come back. Now, we're going to see several things today. We're going to see how God often records things that aren't His will, but that happen in the lives of the characters of the Bible. Um, we're going to see that. We're also going to see how God continues to develop Jacob in his, uh, in his relationship with God, in his own personality. You know, Jacob, like all of us, has personality flaws and uh, character flaws, and so we see those come out in the stories. But today we pick up as Jacob has been fleeing from Laban, his father-in-law, to go back home. And uh, along the way, uh, he comes to the point where he and Esau are going to meet. And uh, his brother Esau, if you remember, uh, is very angry. The last time he and Esau had a conversation, Esau wanted to kill uh, Jacob. That was 20 years ago. In the meantime, both of them has ra have raised families, have raised, uh, raised their wealth, have become uh, strong men, you could say, in their own communities. But now e Jacob is coming to Esau's land and he gets word that Esau is on his way with 400 men. Now, if you're Jacob and you know Esau wants to kill you, you probably think you don't have much of a chance. So Jacob is in this difficult place between two points. One, the relative security of being with Laban, who was deceptive and manipulative, and the insecurity of being with Esau. But in the middle of all this, remember, Jacob has been told by God to go to the land of Canaan, right? So Jacob's already been told to do this. We see that in previous chapters. And so he's on this journey that God has called him to, and along the way, he's running into difficulties. So how does he handle this? Well, wonderfully, in Genesis 22, verses 9 through 12, we see that Jacob takes a humble place. So we see that Jacob's character has developed and changed over time, that now he's more humble than he was before. We see that his pride has been lessened, and he understands because he's leaned on God in the difficult days of being with Laban, he understands that as he has leaned on God and seen God's work happen in his own life, he understands that God is the one who's in control. So let me read to you some of what he says. He, he prays as he knows that Esau is on his way to meet him, and in his fear, of Esau and as well as his desire to be obedient to God. This is what he says. He says, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your own country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. That's humility. He recognizes his unworthiness of the blessings that God has given him. Therefore, he responds with obedience. He says, I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan. But now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make you, your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So Jacob had learned the lesson of humility. And this difficult lesson that we all have to learn that first we have to be humbled by God. And once we're humbled and he gives us provision, then our response should be this humble following where we recognize everything we have is from the Lord. Every good thing around us is from the Lord. And the bad things we experience are the consequences of either our own sin, someone else's sin, or the natural operations of the world, of a fallen world. But God is involved and is there to help us through all of those things. The bad things we experience are there to teach us, to train us, to grow us, to shape us into the people that can follow the Lord really, really well. And so uh, Jacob is following this process. Now we'll see, <laughs> he's still not perfect. Because from there, we go to this point where uh, Jacob meets with God and wrestles with God. Now this is a significant event because Jacob sends all the people, all of his people across the Jordan River, um, they, they cross that, that river in Jacob spends the night by himself and he wrestles with God. This is one of those times when God appears and he appears in a limited way, but he wrestles with Jacob for a purpose because he's going to rename him Israel. In the, at the end of this wrestling match that lasts all day long, 
God touches Israel, uh, Jacob's hip and, and hurts it. So Jacob now lives with a limp the rest of his life. But that limp is evidence of his wrestling with God. And this is such a beautiful example of what we do all our lives. If you're seeking after God, you're moving in a Godward direction, then what you're going to be doing is wrestling with God. And you're not going to win, <laughs> but your own flesh will wrestle with the truths that God gives you. And so God renames Jacob Israel in this wrestling match. And at the end of it, and Israel means one who wrestles with God and man. You can see this even today in the nation of Israel. As, uh, as, as Israel continues to wrestle with you know, the lack of a place to worship, that the, they don't have the Temple Mount right now, they have the Wailing Wall. There's just all kinds of parallels we don't have time to go through today. But we see that God is still faithful to Israel as well as to us. Now, as the story continues on, Jacob and Esau meet the next day, and to Jacob's surprise, Esau has, has forgiven the past and is welcoming Jacob with open arms. But it still seems like it's not a very trustworthy relationship, and so Jacob sends Esau on, and uh, on home, and then goes a different direction, even though Esau had invited him to come to his place and join him there. Instead, Jacob, out of obedience, goes to the land that God had told him to. He doesn't go and conquer it. He goes and buys land and there begins to develop his family. But then we get a uh, we get another story. Um, boy, that's a tough one. It's one of those places where God records in the scripture a horrific event, but he doesn't really condone anything that happens here. He's demonstrating the evil character of the world at the time and the hardness in the hearts of men. And so in this story, we have where Dinah, one of the daughters of Isaac, or of Israel, rather, Jacob and Israel, um, is, uh, is raped by one of the men of the community, a wealthy, powerful young man who sees her and lusts after her and then rapes her. And then because of the rape, now he wants to marry her. Well, obviously, Dinah doesn't want to marry him. And uh, this has been a great offense to Jacob and his family. Now, unfortunately, Jacob, who is still fearful, he's in the land now, but he's still afraid. He's lost a lot, but he gained a lot, and he's afraid of losing it, and there's a lot of men in this land, and he's new to the territory, and uh, he's afraid they'll all gather together and attack him. So he doesn't do anything. He tries to keep the peace, even though his daughter just got raped. Now, Dinah's two natural brothers, uh, Simeon and Levi, decide that they're going to go and play a trick through deception a lot like Jacob has done in the past. And they, they gather up and go to the men who had done the rape and they say, hey look, if everybody in the town gets, uh, 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 gets circumcised, if all the men in the town get circumcised, then we will make peace with you and you can marry Dinah and, and we'll marry your daughters and we'll all be, be one big happy family. And so the men agree to this. This powerful man who is an entitled brat, if you read the story, it's obvious that's who he is. Um, he uh, he convinces all the men to get circumcised. And so three days later, when all the men are still in pain and they're stuck in bed from this circumcision, remember, they got circumcised without pain meds. <laughs> they got circumcised without some of the blessings we have today. And so they got circumcised. They were in pain. These brothers of Dinah go into the town and they kill every single man. And then they take the women and they take the children and they take the stuff and they collect it for themselves. After this, Jacob doesn't, doesn't congratulate them on avenging Dinah. He doesn't, um, he doesn't really reprimand them either. He's just simply afraid that he's going to be attacked and he's going to lose everything that he worked so hard to get. So we see here that Jacob has, has issues. Uh, his sons have issues. The people of, community, of the community have issues. And every last one of them needs a personal relationship with God. So it ends with this reading ends with a tragic story, but ends with the lesson that mankind has always struggled. Mankind has always struggled with its moral character, and um, and that the response to that is not always right. And there will be consequences for everyone involved in the future. So let's uh, uh, let's continue to read our Bibles every day. And I appreciate you being with me today. So may the Lord bless you. Love you guys, and we'll see you on the next one.